you know, 2019 is going to be a great, great year. And anyway, we should do that. Absolutely.
welcome to Aviva. Just before we start the presentation, I'd just like to remind you of all the important statements. And with that, I'd like to invite Mark Wilson to the next presentation. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Um, this is our annual results, so our half year results, our interims. Um, and I guess we've been here for a few years now, and but this year it's been, we come here at a time of, I think it's been quite an interesting sort of summer so far, and I think it was Charles Dickens who said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and I guess in the UK it's the best of the times, if you like, a beautiful hot summer, like we've seen, uh, it's the first time I've seen that in five years, if you like, heroic footballing exploits, it's the first time I've seen that since 1966, or if you like, Love Island. And um, I'm sure some of you have taped it. Um, but it's the worst of times. Uh, well, what can I say? Don't you just love politics? And uh, the closer we seem to get to Brexit, the less anyone seems to know what it's going to look like and the less certainty there is in the market, which is far from helpful. We have trade wars looming on the horizon, and with all of that backdrop, I guess, the investment markets have unsurprisingly been pretty choppy. And despite all those choppy waters and the highs and lows, I think the Aviva results remain reassuringly robust. Uh, we have had EPS growing, our balance sheet's still in great shape. Uh, and I think the results are pretty respectable. And I'd say there's three, three key messages for us to emphasise today. First, we've continued our recent track record of EPS growth. Second, we remain on track to deliver our target of greater than 5% EPS growth this year. And third, our dividend increase signals our confidence in the outlook for the full year and indeed beyond that. So turning to the numbers in a little bit more detail, um, operating uh, earnings per share, EPS, which is of course our key metric as you keep on reminding us, that's up 4%. Our capital position was, uh, as planned, down slightly at the half, mainly due to our capital management actions and a few other things, including debt reduction and the buyback and that remains pretty strong, and that gives us good further opportunities for deployment. Tom will take you through that in a little time. Uh, cash remittances have again grown strongly, and whilst it's customary to focus on remittance at the full year stage, it's worth highlighting that our UK business paid another 500 million special at the first half. And this takes the total specials from the UK to 1.25 billion, since 2016, and as you know, we put a target out there of one billion, so we're uh, in excess of that and growing. And the interim dividend is, of course, up by 10% to 9.25 pence per share. Uh, looking underneath the headline numbers, as you can see here on the slide, the breadth of our performance shows uh, the quality of the businesses we have left. And there's been some good execution from our teams, which on the whole, I'm reasonably satisfied with. Uh, for example, we have seven of our eight major markets, and in those we've delivered attractive growth that ranges from 17 to 14%. Uh, and our performance in 2018, I should say, and 2017 for that matter, it demonstrates a couple of key points. First, greater than 5% growth is a credible target that most of our core businesses are delivering or in fact exceeding. Second, there is real value in our diversity. Because that diversity, it helps smooth the short-term variability in growth and the short-term variability in one-offs that naturally will occur across businesses. So let's look close, more closely at what's driving our major market growth. As you can see on this slide, the UK is our largest market. It continues to make solid progress. Growth here is driven by long-term savings, uh, which saw net inflows in the period of £2.5 billion. And annuities and equity release 
where we have grown assets and sales. Um, BPAs in particular had a you know, five-fold increase. In both segments, we are benefiting from the structural growth drivers and we are winning market share. So we're picking up market share in those segments. We also had a good contribution from the other line, and that's as a result of releases and longevity reserves, which we expect co to continue for some time. And despite higher weather costs, the beast from the east, as it was a beautiful name that, uh, the UK GI team has done a good job with 94.3% core, which I think after the weather is in fact an excellent <coughs> result. Outside the UK, I'm particularly pleased by the performance of our European businesses. We've kept up the good momentum in France and Poland, and we're seeing uh, an improved mix towards unit-linked uh, products, which is helpful for our profit. And, and Italy continues to deliver strong sales and net inflows from the new hybrid product we highlighted last year. It's been a good couple of years from Italy since they started the turnaround, and the hybrid product, and they're being a bit more innovative, and in that market, it's uh, bearing fruit. Moving to Singapore, you can see there are similar positive trends to report. Our double-digit growth has continued with significant growth in the advisor channel, uh, again, picking up market share. Aviva Investors, uh, it's in the green. As you've seen from others in the asset management market, though, they have experienced slower growth in the first half. Some of the wind has been taken out of their sales by the stalled growth in AIMS, where last year weaker performance has taken its toll. Now, this has recovered, the performance of AIMS has recovered on a relative basis. And, and so what we're seeing now, the pipeline of asset origination has improved, and you'd expect that to come through. And we're also seeing the benefits of building up our capabilities, our capabilities uh, both in the equity side and in particularly infrastructure debt, and you would expect to see momentum pick up from that as well. Canada remains the outlier on the slide in terms of profit, with our well-documented motor challenges compounded by a particularly difficult half year of weather and CAT. Uh, but with our reinsurance uh, cover, we're immunised for the second half which we see as being, again, helpful for the second half trends. The underlying trends in Canada are showing early signs of improvement, with a £37 million increased in normalised accident year results compared with the second half of 2007, which is in line with where we thought it would be. Now, there's a fair bit to do in Canada, but Colm, uh, and Colm's here, uh, Coleman and his team have made some good progress and we expect improving results in Canada to be a feature of our numbers in future periods. Canada is a very good franchise. And you'll notice that I have yet to mention digital. Well, we're continuing to invest in digital in the UK, uh, in particular in the UK, but, that, but and in Asia and beyond. Uh, we're in the middle of some major in fact, probably our biggest product launch ever, in fact, and pretty exciting product launches uh, based around Aviva Plus. Uh, some of you have seen it. It's new, it's exciting, it's innovative, uh, which we will report back on at a later date. And across all of our markets, I've asked our teams to focus their spend better. Um, I don't think that was as focused as it could have been in the first half. And they are responding, and they're focusing on expanding distribution, improving productivity, cutting out the things we don't want, and also focusing on managing our product mix and controlling the expenses. It's not easy, but the businesses remain focused on a pretty simple goal. And that goal is, for the core businesses, the more mature businesses, greater than 5% growth, and for the smaller businesses, a whole lot bigger than that. And that's just simply through strong execution. It's nothing more. Now, to borrow a footballing cliche, 2018 is likely to be a game of two halves. Uh, well, 4% EPS growth is pretty respectable, uh, and you know, certainly hit a consensus. Um, it's in a very choppy market environment. Our operating profit was down 2%, as we, and we had to overcome a number of pretty big headwinds. The single biggest of these was, of course, Canada, 
where we had an £84 million year-over-year -year drag on results. Uh, closer to home, the beast from the east here in the UK led to higher weather costs in our general insurance business compared to a very benign outturn in the year before. And added to that, as I'm sure you're aware, we had significant changes to our perimeter through asset divestments and the associated loss of earnings also served as a drag. Now, taken together, these negative headwinds more outweighed, more than outweighed, the positive uh, one-offs elsewhere. And as we move into H2, most of these temporary factors will either moderate or reverse, because some of them is just accounting timing. And subject to all those things, I should say, outside our control, we can't yet control weather and effects. So subject to those, we are very confident we can achieve better operating profit in our second half, and ultimately our target of greater than 5% growth in EPS for the full year. We are reaffirming that today. Now, turning to the dividend. As I've said on numerous occasions, for Aviva, providing shareholders with a sustainable and growing dividend is a priority. And I think it's pretty hard to argue that our trend of dividend growth has continued for a number of years now. We've increased our interim dividend by 10% to 9.25 pence per share, and this is the fourth consecutive interim period of double-digit growth in dividend per share. I think that four years makes a trend or a track record. I don't think I need to say any more on that. What about capital deployment? Alongside the ordinary dividend, we remain focused on the opportunities to deploy the significant surplus capital productively to improve the balance sheet and enhance returns. Now, so far, we've paid down this year high-cost debt in May, and there's another tranche coming up later in the year that we have signalled will be paid down as well, more expensive debt. In May, we also announced our £600 million share buyback. And as of today, we are over halfway through this program. And given the current valuation, I'm more than happy to be buying back our stock all day long. And when you add it all up, the buyback, debt reduction commitment, and the M&A initiative so far this year, that accounts for a touch over £1.6 billion, which naturally leads to questions about our plan for the remaining £400 million. Well, we have been and continue to look for interesting bolt-on M&A opportunities. But as you would expect and as you have seen, we're very disciplined and we will not transact unless our financial and strategic criteria are fully met. It's not burning a hole in our pocket and we have looked at a lot. And so we will be pragmatic here. If we can't find the right M&A, which is unlikely, frankly, uh, to complete a deal in the second half of the year, we will use it to either reduce debt or roll it forward into the next year. Either way, it gives us additional flexibility in terms of the timing and the scope of the options we could consider across our three primary uses. And of course, those three primary uses are M&A, debt reduction, and additional capital returns. Uh, we have a rather large pile that we expect to continue to grow. So in summary, I've decided to keep my comments uh, this morning very brief uh, because it's been a feature of our recent results that the numbers have been cleaner and simpler with less stuff below the line and they simply require less explanation. That's no accident. We've been working on this for years. You know, we've sold off our lower quality and subscale businesses We've improved the quality of our balance sheet to have this surplus capital position. And as a result, we are delivering, finally, broad-based EPS growth. We're on track to hit our target of better than 5% growth in operating EPS for the full year. And we continue to deliver a growing dividend. And on that very simple note, I'll turn you over to Tom. He'll take you through the numbers and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for some detailed questions. Tom. 
Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everyone. I want to give a special welcome and shout out to my summer interns who are joining us here this morning. So welcome, guys. Glad you're here to judge me as I've been judging you this summer. <laughs> as you've heard, operating EPS was up 4%. And consistent with our messages from March, this result was driven by our major markets, which increased operating profit by 5%. It's a solid start to the year and would have been even better but for the weakness in Canada. Operating EPS after integration and restructuring costs was up 8%. We're now absorbing all change spend within operating expense, unless it's so material that it makes sense for us to treat it differently. Change is just a fact of life at Aviva. As Mark summarized, seven of the eight major markets delivered increases in operating profit, and as you can see here, results in Europe were notably strong. Looking beyond the major markets, we've significantly increased investment in modernizing our IT systems, moving more to the cloud, and we've begun spending to prepare for the implementation of IFRS 17. These are both temporary programs, but they will run for a few years. We're also doing more today to digitize our business, which you can see in the strategic investment line, all of which should make us more efficient and enable us to drive down unit costs. So the point is, we're delivering profit growth and higher returns today, while also making Aviva a better business for the future. Operating return on equity increased from 12.4% to 12.7% over the comparable period last year. And finally, down at the bottom of the slide, you can see that we have foregone earnings from businesses we've sold, and this has affected operating profit, but has been neutralized in earnings per share by our capital management activities, including ongoing share repurchases. I'll talk more about that with my growth outlook at the end. In the meantime, note that the share repurchase has been dilutive to NAV, as you can see from this next slide. Book value per share is down 3% as dividends, the share buyback, AVIF amortization and investment variances offset operating profit. Integration restructuring costs were immaterial and were completely absorbed within operating expenses, so zero on this slide. Basic earnings per share was 7.9 pence. This was down on the prior years. We had lower gains from business disposals in the current year, but also because of a reduction from investment variances. And you should remember that we managed the balance sheet, including our hedging activities, with economic risk management and solvency two as our priority. This protects capital and the dividend, but also results in IFRS accounting volatility from period to period. So turning now to the businesses. Now, since this is just the half year, I'm going to go through some of these slides pretty quickly, but I will spend a bit more time on the UK and Canada. UK insurance had mixed results, with increased profits in long-term savings and annuities, and lower profits in protection and general insurance. The biggest driver of profits was longevity reserve releases, which contributed $200 million in the first half and may contribute more later in the year and possibly next, unless trends reverse. Together, this fueled a 10% increase in profits, which enabled us to afford the higher level of temporary change spend I mentioned earlier. Highlights for the UK insurance include long-term savings net flows up 17% to £2.5 billion. Pounds. Bulk annuity sales quintupled to $1.5 billion. And special cash remittances from the acquisition of Friends Life now total 1.25 billion, exceeding the original 1 billion pound target. Now, one thing that we did not do this period was investment re-risking, which contributed a 54 million pound benefit to operating profit in the comparable period last year, as a liquid asset generation has not kept pace with BPA new business volume so far in 2018. As asset generation catches up later this year, we expect a further boost to profitability, both on new business and possibly on the enforced book. More about this on the next slide. But taking a closer look at our four core segments in the UK, annuities and equity release operating profit was up 4% to 322 million on an 83% increase in sales, with new business margins temporarily depressed because of timing differences in putting on liabilities and matching them with the desired asset mix. On these volumes, the difference between the asset mix we've been pricing and the assets we actually had on hand implies about a 70 million pound difference in operating profit. So as we originate our liquid assets to match with these liabilities in the second half of this year, we should have an opportunity to recognize more profit. <coughs> Long-term savings profit was up 19% to 106 million on the back of positive net flows of 2.5 billion and consistent margins within our target range. This is a big business with assets under administration of 121 billion, of which platform assets increased 12% to 23 billion. In protection, you may recall that we experienced some large losses in our existing business last year. This is still weighing on profit in 2018, which declined to 108 million, 
as we've put in some rate increases and written less new business. Turning to general insurance, our combined operating ratio remains strong at 94.3%, but it's up on last year primarily because of comparatively worse weather. As a result, operating profit declined 6% to $195 million. Net written premiums were flat in a competitive market, but we shifted our mix with growth of 5% in commercial non-motor and 11% in direct home, offset by a 4% reduction in personal motor. We continue to emphasize underwriting discipline with the normalized core improving four tenths to 96.1%. Now, in addition to the four core segments you can see on this slide, our legacy segment contributed 188 million of profit, similar to the same period last year, as market movements and backbook management offset the anticipated effect of maturing balances. As we look forward into the second half of the year, we would point out the potential for additional benefits from longevity reserve releases. And while we've guided that the other segment in UK insurance should generally contribute 150 to 200 million per year, last year it was above this level, and it may be above that level again this year. In the first half, other contributed a net 107 million, with longevity releases partly offset by an increased product governance provision regarding historical Friends Provident advised sales. Now, this relates to a discrete number of policies with over 90% of the cases advised between 1994 and 2002. So summing it all up, Aviva's UK insurance business continues to grow, so far this year propelled by annuity volumes and long-term savings flows. Now, let's deal with Canada next. Unfortunately, our Canadian results continue to disappoint, although weather-related costs have not helped our turnaround here. For those of you like a I might like a quick reminder. Last year, we went from 71 million of profits in the first half to 25 million of losses in the second half as a long spell of favorable reserve development dried up and revealed that we needed price increases in the business. In fact, over the seven years through 2016, reserves had developed favorably by 3.8 points per year on average, primarily driven by Ontario auto reforms in 2010 and 2012. All this good news stopped in 2016. So in response, we've been putting through price increases and changing the business under the leadership of new CEO, Colm Holmes, who we moved uh, to Canada in January from our UK GI business. Now, rate increases take time to achieve in Canada, in many cases requiring provincial regulatory approval, and then it takes time for the policies to renew and business to be written and earned under the new rates. So this is, by definition, a multi-year turnaround project, even if it is relatively straightforward to pursue. You can see this in the trajectory of our results, looking at the slide. If you focus on the figures excluding the impact of weather and prior year development, that is the bright green bars, you can see that over the last three years, that last three half year periods, we've dropped from 100 million profit down to 11 million loss and bouncing back up to 26 million profit. This bounce back in 2018 in underlying profitability should continue over the latter half of this year and 2019 and on toward our target of mid-90s combined operating ratio by 2020. Net written premiums have increased 5% this period in Canada, primarily because of rate increases in personal lines. The overall combined operating ratio remained elevated at 104.6% in the first half of the year, coming down from 105.3% in the second half of last year. The underlying improvement was 2.5 points, but weather added 2.2 points relative to our long-term average. Now, I should further add that the RBC book has increased our exposure to Ontario Motor, which, is partic which was particularly impacted by weather in this period, and which will take further time and effort to reprice. We've been converting RBC over to Aviva Systems, claims practices, and reserving methods. And longer term, we see good opportunities to diversify our footprint more broadly with RBC in terms of geography and product mix while benefiting from our alliance with Canada's best known financial services brand. We still view this as a very good deal for us in the long term. So the turnaround in Canada remains a work in progress, with time being one of the biggest factors in getting us back to where we want to be. Year on year, we probably will be about flat on operating profit, subject always to weather impacts, but with an improving trend and an expectation of making additional progress throughout 2019. So let me touch on Aviva Investors before shifting over to our European businesses. Aviva Investors grew operating profit 7% to 76 million pounds. 
The first half operating margin increased with revenue growth once again outpacing increases in expenses. The Ames range of funds improved its relative performance and has assets under management of 12 billion, which is down 5% from year end, albeit during a period of industry outflows. Overall, Aviva investors experienced 3.7 billion of net outflows, the majority of which were from lower margin internal legacy products. External clients continued to account for 35% of revenue and 21% of AUM. And looking forward, in addition to specializing in multi-asset funds and infrastructure origination, Aviva Investors is focused on building stronger capabilities in equities and U.S. credit. So next over to France, and congratulations to Les Bluff for their well-earned World Cup victory. Now Aviva's business in France has likewise put in a strong first half, and we're optimistic about more wins in the future. The business environment in France has remained relatively good for us, although we would still like to see higher interest rates. Aviva's operating profit from continuing operations was up 12% to 279 million due to higher new business volumes, continued improvement in product mix, and lower expenses. Within this, our GI operating profit was down 8% in local currency, as core increased to 95.5% as a result of less favorable prior year development. Now, we continue to be very pleased with the progress in France and believe that by focusing on expense efficiency, customer needs, and the productivity of our distribution channels, we can imp improve performance still further. In Poland, we made steady progress in the first half with operating profit up 4% in local currency to 95 million. Life insurance results were up 8% because of higher fee income and our emphasis on high margin protection products. GI was slightly lower due to reduced profitability of motor insurance. Core increased but remained attractive at 89%. In Italy, Life insurance value of new business, VNB, increased 194% due to the continued success of our innovative hybrid product. This will flow into future profits. In GI, we've tightened our underwriting, which has resulted in more profit on lower premium volume. Overall, Italy grew operating profit by 7% in constant currency to 82 million. And I want to stress that we're continuing to support the growth momentum in Italy, despite the recent economic volatility arising from potential changes in government fiscal policies. There's still a lot more we can do to make this a bigger and better business. On to Ireland. Operating profit increased 11% in constant currency to 50 million, with stronger results on the life side more than offsetting a small decline in general insurance. We're emphasizing continued discipline in GI underwriting despite increasing competition. Aviva Ireland's combined operating ratio remained strong at 87.1% despite increased weather-related claims. And we completed the acquisition of Friends First toward the end of the half, so this should add to our business here in the years to come. And finally, Singapore. Operating profit in Singapore was up 10% in constant currency to 46 million, as life operating profit increased 22%, overcoming an increase in losses from GI and health insurance businesses. As a reminder, these products are important for our overall customer footprint in Singapore. Life VNB rose 47% on higher sales and mixed shift toward protection. Our Aviva Financial Advisors Network has increased the number of advisors by 15% from the end of the year last year to 772 now. This, of course, should support future growth in sales and profits. Okay. Switching away from the business units and back to Aviva overall, we remain very well capitalized with a solvency to cover ratio of 187%, which exceeds our working range of 150 to 180. This is after returning 1.8 billion pounds to investors through dividends, hybrid debt repayment, and share repurchase commitments in the first half of the year. In addition, economic uncertainty in Italy contributed to adverse market movements of approximately 400 million in aggregate as government bond spreads widened. Now, thankfully, we came into the situation carrying excess capital in Italy, and we still expect a dividend from Italy this year, even as the business undergoes significant growth. Underlying capital generation of 700 million was down relative to the first half of last year because of the loss in Canada, increased strain from higher BPA volume, and disposals. Now, by the end of July, we'd spent 376 million pounds to repurchase seven, 74 million ordinary shares at an average price of 510 pence per share. At recent prices, that average would obviously come down as we complete the 600 million pound program. 
In addition, we would anticipate repaying without refinancing the 575 million US dollar denominated hybrid debt issue available for first call in November. And it's likely that the, we will apply the unspent portion of this year's M&A budget to additional debt deleveraging for the time being, and thereafter roll it forward into potential capital redeployment next year. In terms of other capital actions, I'd note that these uh, have typically been more significant for us in the second half of the year, in part because we apply for model changes once a year with the appropriate regulators and receive the results of that process toward the end of the year. Last year, we obtained approval for the use of the Dynamic Volatility Adjuster, DVA, in France, but it's backed out of our overall group figures. This year, we're looking for approval to reflect that French DVA in our overall group Solvency II capital. In addition, we are pursuing a new supplementary pension fund structure in France called FRPS, which could also benefit our capital position. So we're both redeploying excess capital surplus and trying to optimize our Solvency II position still further. <clears throat> All right, now finishing up with our growth outlook. We are reaffirming management's guidance for operating EPS growth to exceed 5% for the full year 2018. In the first half of this year, we grew operating EPS by 4%. And as a reminder, in 2017, we grew operating EPS by 15% in the first half, so comparisons this year were quite challenging, especially with the loss in Canada. So we believe we remain well on track and should pick up speed in the second half of 2018. And if we simplify this story for you so far this year, you can see that the impact of capital management, that is hybrid debt repayment and share repurchases, some of which took place during 2017 and more of which is taking place now in 2018, had the effect of neutralizing the foregone earnings from businesses sold. Foreign exchange and the effective tax rate had a very small contribution. Other factors, including the impact of assumption changes, adverse weather, and temporarily elevated change spend, were altogether a drag of about 1% on operating EPS. And underlying business growth was approximately 5%. So you can see that we're managing the rate of change spend to modernize our IT, moving more to the cloud, as well as implementing IFRS 17 and other initiatives at a pace that allows us both to improve the business and hit our financial targets. For the full year 2018, uh, our outlook, we continue to expect our major market businesses to grow more than 5%, although Canada looks likely to be broadly comparable with the prior year given the impact of weather. We expect the other factors approximately to offset each other, enabling us to grow operating EPS by at least 5% for the year. Now, I caution that, of course, this outlook is subject to factors outside our control, like foreign exchange movements, regulatory change, and weather. And I should also point out that the share repurchase and debt reduction we're doing this year will also benefit EPS in 2019, as should the expected partial recovery in Canada. And so our confidence in the current outlook is reflected today in our decision to increase the interim dividend by 10%. This indicates that we should be able to meet our operating EPS growth target in 2018, as well as make progress this year on increasing our dividend payout ratio toward the target range of 55 to 60% by 2020. <coughs> all in all, as Mark summed up earlier, this has been another period of respectable progress for Aviva, with still room to get better and to deliver more. Back to you, Mark. Thank you, Tom. So as you can see from where we are, uh, EPS up four, dividend up 10, um, you know, pretty solid set of numbers, I think, and that's what we were after. So on that note, let's open it up to questions. Chris, you'll run the questions as always. Boss. Had to start on this side, didn't we? Ashik. Uh, hi, good morning, uh, Mark, Tom. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, this is Ashik Masadi from JP Morgan. One is uh, French. You mentioned that uh, there are some benefits coming on the French solvency ratio. So first of all, what is the French solvency ratio? What uh, can we quantify the benefits? Does it mean more cash out of France? That would be the first one. Second one is there is a bit of noise about the lifetime mortgage uh, consultation paper. Can we give some thoughts, uh, some sort of numbers? that will help us understand what could be the downside risk on lifetime mortgage on the back book and on the new business. I'll Thank take you. the first one, maybe Tim Dex. It doesn't impact liquidity so much because we already have in the French DVA and the other things, because we already have that in the model. 
Uh, it makes quite a significant difference to the group numbers, though, because it's been backed out historically. And so we're applying for it. There was, as you've seen, a, a open note on DVA, and that means uh, that we are, how can I say, highly likely to get that in our solvency uh, this year. Um, so we can see quite significant upward movements there. We're not going to quantify it today, but I guess if you have a look at the numbers, you'll probably be able to work it out. Yeah, just to expand on that a, a little bit, the, um, the benefit of the French DVA is, is sort of already affected our, um, our, our cash liquidity position with, with France, so we already have that benefit. Now, the FRPS project that we've got going on this year would be another uh, benefit, not just to the solvency two cover ratio, but also to our ability to get uh, liquidity and dividends out of France in the future. So, so again, good work going on there. Um, in, in terms of your question on the, the consultation paper on, on equity release, um, expected we get a, a question on that. We're still uh, actively involved in the consultation progress uh, process right now. We've got a good dialogue with, um, uh, with the PRA and, and others on that uh, consultation. Um, we have a number of differences of opinion and think that this would end up requiring us to hold you know, uneconomic amounts of capital that would be redundant to what we already have, have reserved. So we continue to work on that. Um, now, if we end up with an adverse outcome here, we'll take mitigating actions to deal with that in terms of structuring and potentially thinking about you know, how we structure and hold that risk or, or whether we rely on other parties for some of that. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think in terms of, uh, you know, worst case outcome on this, it could be several points on our solvency two cover ratio, but remember, we're a big diversified company, so it's no more than that. And I'd also remind people that two years ago, right after Brexit, we took a 300 million pound, um, effectively Brexit reserve for adverse movements in property prices. We're still hanging on to that reserve, and we continue to do that until we've got some clarity, hopefully sometime next year. But if we ended up with a point where we've got redundancy around equity release and then redundancy in that Brexit reserve, it wouldn't make sense for us to sort of double up on that, and that probably would mean that we would want to release something somewhere. So overall, I'd say this shouldn't have a very big impact for us. Thank you. Hi. Um, it's Alan HSBC. Ah. Uh, I've got two questions. Um, first off, on the annuity asset allocation in the UK, where you said uh, the origination of illiquids was slightly behind the new business sales, uh, what gives you confidence in 2H that you're going to catch up? And looking forward, if you were to write an uh, increasing amount of BPA, does that mean there's going to be a timing difference in terms of asset origination coming through versus sales? Uh, and the second question is, on the solvency to capital generation, where you pointed it slightly lower this, this time because of Canada and the UK, is there anything else in there that we should take note, any one-offs, et cetera, in the underlying capital generation? Thanks. You can uh, take those. Um, so in, in terms of uh, asset origination, you know, last year Viva Investors originated $4 billion of, of um, infrastructure assets, so we clearly have the capability to do this. Um, we're not chasing assets. We're being very selective in making sure that what we get is what uh, our, our UK life insurance business wants. Um, but we are confident that we will be able to get that uh, asset volume in the second half of, uh, of this year. Um, in terms of the impact, I mentioned that it was about uh, 70 million pounds on operating profit. I should probably also mention that in terms of VNB, it's probably about a 57 million pound um, you know, opportunity there that, that we would end up seeing in the, in the full year results. So on an ongoing basis, um, you know, for us to be able to write uh, uh, BPAs it, in terms of the volume that we did in the first half, we should be able to do that on a consistent basis, but we're going to be careful. We're only going to write deals that make sense for us, so you may see that volume go, go up or down. Um, likewise, on solvency two capital generation, I, I noted some of the, um, uh, the, the points there. You know, if, if you go back to what I've said in past times, um, you know, I think we've been pleased that underlying solvency two capital generation has been relatively consistent. But we are looking for opportunities to grow the business, and so the additional BPA strain that we've seen in this first half is, um, is an example of that. Um, again, if we get the assets coming in, that helps to reverse that strain. Um, and then we've got the, the, the Canada uh, loss, and, and again, we would expect that to reverse at some point in the future. But otherwise, there's, there's, um, there's not a lot of one-offs in that. And I mean, the fact is we're not capital constrained, and with the issues particularly like France, I think you will see 
um, the trend on the growing upside rather than the downside, uh, even with the risks we see. The other thing in annuities is we did have a five, uh, so on BPAs, we did have a five-fold increase in the first half. Uh, although you, we should see that coming through in BNB and profit in the second because of the issues Tom spoke about, you wouldn't expect that same level of growth in the second half. Um, you know, we will be tactical here and we'll take opportunities with our brand and our scale, we can do it. But that was still a very large increase in the first half. You would expect an increase, but not that same level, I wouldn't have thought. Johnny Vo. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, Johnny Vo from uh, Goldman Sachs. Just a couple of questions. Just uh, again on the BPA outlook. I mean, you said that it's quite lumpy in the first half, but clearly this is a growth strategy for you. So how do you yeah. feel that you're um, prepared relative to competitors? And given there's so many competitors in the market, this first question. The second question is just uh, in regards to warehousing of assets. Is it a problem of warehousing assets? Is that what you've not done, or is it just a, pro a problem of origination? Um, and then the third question is just if you can talk about um, the competing tension of now a growth strategy in BPA versus, um, you know, debt reduction, capital returns, and the tension between your IFRS leverage and Solvency II, because clearly you've put in place hedges to protect your Solvency II, which has negatively impacted your IFRS. Yeah, okay, uh, good, good question. I'll answer some of it and Tom will answer some of it. So. How we prepared, we hired Tom Ground, who has been uh, very successful for us. We hired him from a competitor. And he, he did teach us a few things. Um, we realised that our ability to generate uh, assets is one of the best in the market, certainly with the scale that we've done. Our brand is helpful, and what we've proved is our ability to cross-sell. So a lot of these things are coming from existing customer relationships and that does give us an advantage and that's allowed us to increase fivefold. Just to be clear though, um, our strategy is different from um, others in the market. Our strategy is saying we will play in sectors of the market where we see uh, margins and as margins increase or decrease we will come in and out of the market whether that's group life, BPA, pensions, whatever and at the moment We've done that quite effectively. Um, you know, you had some big sort of trade sales in the first half. That soaked up some of the ability of others to perform. We saw margins in a pretty good space. We took uh, account of that. But our, our ability to generate, our balance sheet, which I think is better than most in our brand, are where, are where we compete. I don't see much tension. I mean, it, do, it is quite a capital-intensive product, but capital is not our constraining factor, is it? And um, so capital is now a constraining factor anymore. It's just as a strategy for the group, we do want balance across more than one product because then as rates change, as legislation changes, we can still keep our greater than 5% growth going on. Yeah, so let me pick up on your, your second two questions on warehousing and again on leverage. So um, we don't have any problem with warehousing. As a matter of fact, we've got sort of the opposite problem that we have a very big appetite for illiquid assets because it's not just the new business that we need to fund, but we also have a pool of assets um, that we picked up from the Friends Life acquisition that were, were more run for, on a solvency one basis and are invested in mm -hmm. corporate bonds. And so we have the ability to um, create value there even if we're not writing new business, we can still apply illiquid assets to that back book. Just if you look at our comparable period a year ago, you'd see that we had a 54 million pound benefit from doing that. So I'd encourage you know Goldman Sachs, all the banks out here, to be showing us all the illiquid assets you can because we've got a very big appetite, not just to feed the new business, but also to feed the back book. At the same time, we're going to be selective about what we take, and it's got to you know meet our risk parameters and our, our diversification limits, et cetera, and so forth. So there may be times where we run ahead or behind in terms of asset generation versus liability generation. On the, um, on the IFRS leverage point, um, again, we're managing primarily to the Solvency II balance sheet. We look at leverage on that basis, um, but we are acutely aware from talking to investors that a lot of investors and a lot of analysts are benchmarking us on an IFRS basis relative to peers. We liked it to move ourselves closer to where peers are. Um, the economic variances will move from time to time, you know, period to period, so I wouldn't focus too much on that. Um, but in terms of the overall amount of debt leverage, that is something that we have our eye on right now. Dominic Armani. 
Good morning. Uh, Dom Omani from Exam BNP Paribas. Thank you very much. Um, two technical questions and then one business question. Um, on the business question, just another follow-up on, on the bulk market. Um, thinking more into future years, everyone's very excited about the level of growth in the market as a whole in, in 2018. Do you see this as the beginning of a trend or actually is it a sort of a bit of a blip created by, by present circumstances? Any thoughts on that? And then the two technical questions. You mentioned the Brexit reserve of 300 million, uh, which you could potentially release if you have an adverse um, decision on the, um, the lifetime mortgages. Um, is that an IFRS or a solvency or both um, metric? Can you release that into both lines? Um, and then a technical question also on the, um, on the spare capital if you don't complete the M&A budget. Um, so you've got 400 million available. There's, there's some callable bonds in 2019. Um, I don't think there are more callable bonds available in 2018. You're referring to the 2019 uh, bonds, or actually, are there other measures you can use to, 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 to mm. <coughs> sorry, to delever? Thank you. Mm. Okay, uh, on the BPAs, look, it's a market that you have a structural growth in, but you also have a structural growth in workplace place pensions. The question in BPAs is what will happen to the margins, and you've got a number of players of which. We are there, and if we're there or thereabouts in the price, with our relationships, we tend to pick it up. If we're uh, not there, if we're not prepared to cut our margin, we won't. So, I mean, it's not much more complex than that. Um, it, is, it is a growth market. You also have a market that we could play in, as we said last time, like Canada, if we want to. The question is, do we want to? And, and so we have the capability, we have the asset generation, we have the brand. To me, it's just simply a question of margin. And um, so I think the hype in the market is over-egged on the potential in that market. It's one of the levers we can pull, but we have a lot of levers we can pull. And as rates go up, uh, you might see more of a trend again. So let's assume, I don't know if the market's right, we'll see rates rise by 25 bips. If they rise another 50 or 75 bips, individual annuities start looking really attractive again, and clearly we're a leader there too. So um, as rates change, you will get different markets come to the fore. Uh, so it's a market, it's key for us. I wouldn't over -egg it. Okay, picking up your two technical questions, um, and I'm looking at my UK CFO to make sure I get this right, but the, uh, the Brexit reserve is both IFRS and Solvency II. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, capital and what we're likely to do, I, I think at our Capital Markets Day that we do later this year, we'll talk more about capital planning for next year. I think the simplest thing for me to think about is we've got a 350 million euro two-year note that matures this fall. You know, we can just let that mature and, and not refinance it, although the all-in cost of that note is only 11 basis points, so I'm sort of unhappy to see that funding go away. Um, next year, we've got 200 million of hybrid debt that comes up for maturity, so obviously we would look at that, but what we do with the rest, um, we haven't so totally decided. But we will give you a bit more clarity later in the year if that helps. But today we'll focus on the numbers. Greg Patterson. I heard someone ask what about the PRIFs? Um, uh, it's Yuma, South African Yuma. Um, the uh, the uh, three questions, one is if you just update on the platform migration, there's been a lot of negative press Ori, that um, in the UK. Uh, second point, uh, UK GI prior year development. There's a big swing there. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about the sustainability or sort of what sort of level we should think about in terms of UK prior year development. And the third thing, um, uh, your loans. I think you've got sort of circa 25 million pounds of loans. Could you talk about um, to what degree they are internally rated, what their average rating uh, is and what the PRA thinks about that. I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to the fact that one of your competitors, the Just Group, was forced to move a whole bunch of its internal ratings from double A to single A. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand the potential for the risk that you might have to do that and it hit your solvency mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not going to comment on them. <coughs> we, it's so uh, we all take different degrees of prudence in our assumptions, so I, w I won't comment on the others. Um, maybe Andy, oh, where's Andy? If Andy can maybe comment on the platform. Uh, and what's happening. I do know we've still had some pretty strong inflows, so we have had some significant issues, but uh, clearly uh, the market still likes what that platform does. So, so our platform's part of our long-term savings business where profits were up 19% to uh, £106 million. Um, 
the overall net fund flows in, in the uh, long-term savings up 17% from 2.1 billion to 2.5 billion. If you kind of break that down between the different parts, on the platform side, we, we saw net fund flows fall from 3 billion last year to 2.2 billion in the first half of this year. So, uh, so that was lower. We had very strong performance in workplace pensions and, and also uh, a stronger kind of retention of the personal pension books. The net effect was overall they were up. In terms of the platform issues, we have had significant issues as, as has been well documented. We basically needed to migrate the platform to much more modern technology given the rate of growth in this market. We continue to grow assets in the platform space now for us are at 20, 23 billion. Um, uh, we've, we've dealt with many of those issues. We've still got a few residual ones we're working through over the next uh, few weeks, but uh, we, we expect to be kind of fully back in shape uh, later this year and, uh, and, and back to historical levels of growth there. Okay, so picking up your, your next two questions on prior development in UKGI, I, I think if you're just looking at that over multiple periods, I'd say that that's a relatively short tail book. Um, and although actuaries try to get their best estimates, you know, my experience is they're typically conservative, and so I would naturally expect to see a, a small amount of favorable development you know, year after year after year on average, but it'll move around. There'll be some years where there may be a little bit of strengthening and other years where there will be releases. Um, in, in terms of, of the loans, um, uh, my understanding is that that is an industry issue that the, the PRA is, has, has been looking at. Um, it's something that we are doing a lot of work on ourselves right now. I, I don't think I can quantify the impact that you're looking for. Um, I'd say more generally that we always have regulatory risk and sometimes things go our way, sometimes they go against us, but that's just part of the business and it's something that we manage every day. Andrew Cream. Um, good morning, Sandra Crean, George Autonomous. A couple of questions. I saw the, uh, right in thinking there was negative PYD in France. Could you give us a bit more detail around that? And secondly, could you give us a bit more detail on this C CP1318 issue? I mean, you said several points, but it's quite difficult to magnify that. There's three issues. There's whether the matching adjustment <coughs> is too great, whether your house price assumptions are not strong enough, and particularly important, the level of transitionals coverage and uh, the PRA's view that you, that should be wound back. Could you give us a bit more um, accuracy around what the impact would be if the, uh, uh, if the CP goes through as is? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just to correct something, you didn't actually say seven. We said so the worst case would be a few points. I, think. I, I said several points. Several points. Yeah. A yeah. few points. Yeah. Well, why don't I start with that one then. Um, look, I, I can't decompose that for you. What I can say is that sort of the biggest impact is, uh, is whether transitionals apply, whether this is effectively retroactive on the, the existing business or whether it would be treated as something new. Um, so that is one of the issues under discussion. Um, otherwise, I, I can't give you specifics in terms of, of decomposing the rest. And I, I'd also say that there's a lot of ongoing work that we're, we're doing, looking at various interactions, et cetera, so it may have different results by the time we actually get into applying it. There's also, you can do things to mitigate it as well as Tom said before. You can change where you put the risk and who carries it. There's, it's not quite that simple. We'll come back to you. But um, for us, with the size of our book and our diversity, it's not as big an issue, if we can say that. You know, the French development, you want to, Patrick, mm -hmm. or, uh, or yeah, more? Go on then, go on. Good morning, Andrew. Um, yeah, we had very marginal adverse development on our French GI book. We went from uh, 17 million positive last year to 8 million adverse. When we actually looked at it, one loss was 10 million of that. We reload looked at the whole book. We have no discomfort with our French reserves. are fine. It was one, one event. Gordon Aiken. Thanks, uh, Gordon Aiken from RBC. Um, three questions, please. First, on the longevity, the 200 million reserve release for longevity, just can you talk about what that equates in terms of table names. Um, second, we say you can buy back stock all day long at these levels, um, you know, 150 to 180 percent range. You're at above that 187. And my sense from you is that you'd be very happy, you know, not to be anywhere near the top of that range. Um, I'm sure the regulator would be happy for you to be as low as 150. So why not buy stock all the way down to, to 150? And, and third, on this um, PRA consultation on equity release mortgages, um, I mean, first I'd love to know what your deferment rate is, and the PRA has obviously um, put some numbers out there. Um, but 
and you talk about mitigating what you could do to mitigate this, but presumably you could just offload um, to reinsurance the risk um, of the no-neg um, biting, um, just as you did with longevity risk when, when that um, hit because of um, the risk margin solvency too. Thanks. Well, we should get you on the working team, Gordon. Um, the, look, I'll take the buyback and Tom can take the other ones. Um, at these sort of levels, uh, obviously, uh, it's looking pretty attractive in the buyback, so we're sort of pretty happy um, doing that now. Uh, but as you say, we are outside the top of our range. We get that. Um, the constraint isn't regulatory at all, um, but we're not going to provide any more guidance on that today. What we've said is, you know, we'll provide some more guidance at the Investor Day later this year uh, as we do our planning. We're only you know, halfway through our current buyback. We're paying down 900 million of debt this year. You know, we're, we're returning a fair bit of capital, and yes, next year there'll be another, another chunk there as well, and, but we're not providing any more guidance um, on that today. J just a word on the tables um, on longevity release. We are signalling there is more there. Um, we continue to be at the conservative end. Um, the trends are continuing. So obviously, as you'd expect, unless there's any sort of dramatic reversal of those trends, we've got a fair bit more to go. Um, but we're trying to be prudent and we're trying to do it slowly. Um, you know, you're, there's always a bit of order to pressure to, to do it as well because you know, you've got to be prudent but not overly prudent. So <laughs> there's all the tensions we face. Yeah, just to pick up on that, I, I would say that we, we continue to think we're at the, at the prudent end. And so if you look at the two components of the reserve release we took, um, one of it was something that we could have done last year. So I think I talked at the full year remarks about how 2016 mortality experience was particularly heavy. We treated it effectively as an outlier. And so we didn't give full weighting to it when we went in averaging our experience over a period of years. Continuing to look at that experience, we've concluded that it actually is a fair data point, and so it's gone back into the average. So that's what the 55 million uh, pound release was relate, related to. The other 145 million was also related to experience and some of the data sources that we use in our BPA pricing. And having confirmed some of the modeling that we're using there, we've also now translated that pricing basis into our reporting basis as well. We have not done anything with the CMI 2017 table in the first half. That was just published in March. We continue to work on that, but my expectation is by the time we work through that, um, unless we find something that we haven't seen yet, likely that would be one of the things that we would look at that could have another positive longevity benefit for us in the second half of the year, and there may be other factors as well. And then finally, coming back on the, um, on the equity release consultation paper, we're not providing our deferment rate today. Um, on your point on uh, offloading this through reinsurance, um, <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that we would have to work through. This would be effectively a new market, and whether it's um, more financially uh, motivated investors that were looking to take that bet on prices of, of, of real estate over time, or whether it would be reinsurance, I don't know yet, but that's the kind of work that we certainly would do. The other thing I would say is the PRA is certainly open to consultation. They are genuinely consulting on it for the whole market. You know, the, the government does have a policy of encouraging equity release and um, it has to be prudent and part of their issue is there is a significant range of assumptions in the market and they are clearly trying to get that into a narrower range. Uh, I think that would be a fair statement. Uh, and you've got issues of what you do with the back book and what you do with new business, how they're treated and they may come up with different options for both of those. Let's work through it and see. Blair Stewart. Thank you. It's, uh, it's Blair Stewart from BAML. Um, three questions, I think. Um, I wonder if Ewan could give us uh, an update on the pipeline for liquids and, and also sentiment at the moment towards, towards AIMS. Um, second question, uh, just related to the um, potentially the 1.4 billion of excess liquidity you'll have next year. Um, and related to the share buyback question, I, I guess um, debt leverage might be one of the constraints why you wouldn't just continue to buy your shares back. So I just wonder if you could outline perhaps some of the possibilities. I know you'll return to it later, but what, what, what are the possibilities open to you in terms of reducing debt leverage? Because there's not a great deal um, up for call in the next year or so. And finally, um, You've got an 8 billion uh, cumulative cash remittance target 
uh, running out this year, are you on track to, to hit that? I think it implies a fairly substantial amount in the second half of the year. Thanks. Yeah. We'll start with you. Yeah. I am not Sorry, I need to use, um, yeah, thanks. The, the, I, think, I think one of the things is when you're trying to source um, transactions of that nature, they don't neatly fall into the six-month time windows. And so we actually have quite a range of activity we're working on. And, uh, and we fully expect that we will have some interesting transactions in the second half of the year. So um, it may not quite be the, the four billion that we did last year, but I think we, we're not looking for something materially less than that. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of activity that I think we'll see coming through into, into, into the second half. I think it's important to know, that for, for you to know, that the, the origination, we are, we are paid for origination, so that has a, the fact that that's a second half activity has had a slightly depressing uh, impact on, uh, on Aviva Investor's results in the first half, and so we do expect that to bounce back in the second half. I think, I think the other thing to note is that the, the pipeline, the flow pipeline you, you mentioned, you mentioned AIMS. AIMS is a range of products. It's not just one product. We've got target return, target income, and we've got the AIMS fixed income fund. The AIMS fixed income fund is hitting its return target um, year to date and is quite an attractive proposition. And uh, I think it's fairly well known that some competing uh, absolute return bond funds are in some difficulty at the moment. And so I'm pretty optimistic that we will be able to sell more there. Um, AIMS is positive this year. Many of the funds run on uh, an absolute return basis are, are not. Um, and so we are getting some institutional interest in the second half of the year. It's fair to say retail investors are not so impressed with the returns from AIMS because simple strategies like passive or balanced funds are doing much better. And AIMS as a retail proposition awaits a bit more market disruption and people actually losing money on simpler investment strategies. Institutional flows, though, um, have remained, remained robust. So, um, or sorry, I've been flat, but second half, I think we're quite excited. We have a strategy of diversified excellence of even investors where we're trying to build out other areas of, of growth. And our investment in North American distribution, I expect to bear fruit in the second half of the year. So we're very close to some mandates there that will validate the investment spend that we've incurred in the first half, uh, bearing fruit as quickly as the second half. So um, I think like the results you've been hearing more generally, um, don't, judge, uh, don't judge us by six months numbers. So you asked about possibilities on the, the you know, one to 1.4 billion of, of uh, capital redeployment for, for next year. And, and what I'd say is that we're taking a balanced approach to this. And as we've guided before, as we think about capital, we're trying to protect the dividend and grow the dividend. We want to invest organically in the business. Going beyond that, we'll look at additional partnerships and vault on M&A and past that, it's capital returns to investors. And we've been trying to look at that in a balanced way. So it has been a mix of debt reduction and, um, and buying back shares. And, and we'll continue to look at that balance in, in part depending upon what the capital markets are telling us and what investors are looking for. So we've got a number of investors that would like to see us reduce debt leverage. We've got a number of investors that would like to, to continue buying back stock. You know, at prices below five, uh, it's hard not to want to buy back stock. Um, and with, with interest rates low, again, it's hard not to want to just continue to finance um, in the capital markets. On the other hand, I'd like to see us on a relative basis, you know, look more consistent with others in terms of overall debt leverage. So that's a balancing act that we're just going to have to keep working our way through. Um, in terms of the $8 billion of remittances, um, we should get there. We've got some risks to it. Um, we're getting less out of Canada and Italy in terms of dividends, um, and the divestiture of, uh, F of FPI uh, is taking longer. So those are some things we're working through, but we should get there or pretty darn close if we don't get there. I'd also say, Blair, on, on the debt leverage, I mean, I look at debt maybe diff a little bit differently to some others, and that I think of it as risk-adjusted debt leverage. Our balance sheet has less sensitivity to movements, to um, spreads, to, to rates. Um, it just uh, ha is more resilient. So what's the um, optimum level of debt? Well, it's a little bit unclear. The second thing I would say is you can only do what you can do in debt. We've paid back all of the hybrid that's come up this year, um, you know, we, we only have one tranche of 200, 
I don't know what I say next year. Yeah, yeah 200 coming up next year. Uh, we're not going to do anything early, are we? I mean, that doesn't make sense. So as it comes up, we've been paying it down and, um, you know, there's not a whole lot more we can do on that. Uh, it does mean we still have a fairly big pile of cash. So what do you do it? Yeah, and I, and I would add that we're expecting uh, more cash coming out of our UK uh, uh, life yeah. insurance business, yeah. UKI generally. We've got excess capital there, and we're working on continuing to upstream that. So what we've done in the subs, we have actually built up quite a bit of excess cash, and you would expect to see some of that coming up to the group, and that's some fairly significant numbers. We'll, we'll, we'll look at when we quantify that, but uh, we're just working on that now. Huh? Yeah, we could we could tender for the debt, and and you, you know again we'll we'll look at a, a variety of different things. So we've 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 started with some of the easier things, and, and maybe we will look at tendering for some debt. Thanks, Colin Kelly, UBS. Um, just a question on the the returns on capital. So the showing good expansion of return on capital employed across the business. Um, in saying that, I suppose the quantum of capital is reducing given the debt reduction yep. share buyback. So you know, th there's an increasing need for those returns to keep expanding. So how confident are you and how, where can we get to vis-a-vis -vis the returns on capital employed, particularly in the UK? Because with the equity release, release consultation, while it's manageable for solvency, it potentially would have a, a much bigger impact in terms of returns mm -hmm. on capital for new yes. business. Um, and, and bearing in mind the other business lines, the new business margins are largely at the top are certainly hitting the target ranges for, for, for them. Um, the second question is just on the cash remittances. Again, good growth, 28% year on year, quite a bit ahead of the capital generation. Um, so correctly, solvency is not a constraint, but clearly there's a need to continue to optimize balance sheets locally to expand the capital generation to continue the sustainability of those remittances. Um, can you just update on, on a bit of progress around those actions at local level and confidence on, on that, the continuation of that. Thanks. Do you want to talk about um, I, I'll, I'll talk about the first one because, um, hey, yeah, you're right, you could have been in some of our strategy sessions. Um, uh, because look, we want to reward our CEOs. Our CEOs are holding too much capital, uh, we think, uh, in general, and we would like to uh, focus them on returning them. So, as a, frankly, I'd rather hold it here and we have a fair bit of room in our ranges and a number of subs right now. I, w I won't go into uh, any more detail than that. And I'd like to award them for the capital they hold and the return on that, and you would expect us to do that. Um, so we have a fair bit of room. As Tom said, you know, we're holding a fair bit of excess in the UK, for example. Um, I think we can still move the return on equity up more, and simply, as you say, you know, we're giving some equity back, we're reducing debt. Um, that, that's sort of the objective of what we're trying to do. Um, I'm not going to give any more guidance on the numbers of that. Um, the only numbers we're giving guidance uh, or targets on is the greater than 5% growth in earnings. Um, and uh, you can work out the numbers from that. You want to take a second? Yeah, let me just give you a little bit more color on some of the things that we're doing. Um, we've been using an, ec an economic value added analysis, so an EVA methodology for a few years now. We're actually using it internally on a reporting basis as well to measure our business. Um, so we're looking on a solvency two basis, effectively what returns we're generating over and above our cost of capital over a multi-year time period. So that, that's an internal tool that we're using. Um, maybe someday we'll get to a point where we can disclose that, but, but that's probably several years off at, at best. Um, and then in terms of, of the subsidiaries, I, I think I've said before that when we've looked at where excess capital is building up, it's clear that it's in the subsidiaries. It's in part because of the transition to solvency two, setting risk appetites, and the natural conservatism of local risk officers and boards sort of adding buffers. And as we've gone and looked at that, we've realized we have an opportunity to upstream some of the stock of capital that's there, but also to set better boundaries in terms of what remittance ratio should be on an ongoing basis. And that's a process of getting local boards comfortable that the group is really there to protect them and that they actually can pay down to the buffers that we're looking for. Um, but that should improve not only sort of the one-time cash that's coming up, but also the run rate of cash going forward. And that's part of the work that we're doing in terms of um, moving the payout ratio up over time to, to see how far we can get that. So you're correct. We, we used to talk about how 
capital generation was exceeding cash. Now we're in a position where the cash is caught up above the capital generation, and then at some point we'll be in more of a steady state um, looking out a few years from now. I think cash will exceed it for a while. Though. Yeah, we'll have to train regulators too. Um, if we're trying to make it sound easy, we can just give it up. It's not that easy because in each market, the regulators are like, a, are like an animal in the nicest possible way. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, you realize our regulators in the room. Here yeah, yeah, I know. Today, yeah, so. I know. Uh, and um, but but regulators in various countries behave in different ways with capital and cash, and and you have to go through a lot of discussions on an individual regulator mm -hmm. basis to get to get them to understand your strategy and get them to bring it up. And look, we've been pretty successful with that, and that's why it's a multi-year strategy. We don't go in and take out massive amounts of capital. We do it over time, and I think we've got quite a nice amount of cash in the store. Final question, Abid. Morning, it's uh, Abid Hussain from Credit Suisse. Uh, just two questions, if I can. Uh, firstly, apologies for this, but just coming back on the uh, liquid assets, are you seeing any yield compression versus corporate bonds, and, and does that explain partly why uh, you need to be more selective in, uh, in your origination approach? Uh, and then secondly, could you just briefly describe the trends that you're seeing in the UK motor and home uh, pricing uh, and claims inflation, um, and what, what is the outlook there in your view? Sure, on, on illiquid assets, um, I would say for us it's more, um, uh, for us it's a question about finding assets in the right categories more from a risk perspective than it is really the, the difference in terms of spreads between illiquid assets and, and corporates. Um, there is lots of competition, so you know there are some deals that we like that we, we don't get. Um, but for us, I think it's more around around risk selection and portfolio management than anything else. Um, On the UK, you want to add some colour? Sure. So, so um, uh, in terms of pricing in the market, we're basically seeing um, uh, rate in motor is down circa 10%, um, so quite significant reductions. Home is is up slightly. Claims inflation is in line with broadly what what we would expect. And what we're kind of doing across, so it is a soft market, particularly in motor at the moment, but what we're doing across the UK business is, uh, as, as Mark said a moment ago, allocating capital to the areas where we can get you know, stronger returns. And uh, on the GI side in particular, we had a very strong performance in uh, commercial, particularly property and liability in commercial was up 5%. So we're, we're focusing our efforts on the areas where we can get the stronger returns. And, uh, uh, and, and, and as a composite player across multiple markets, we're able to do that. The other thing we have had quite a bit of success in is in the direct business in the first half and we're sort of not saying too much about it today because we have the big Aviva Plus launch going on but you know, we added on a lot of home, I think we're saying uh, 200,000 um, people in home in direct and 190,000 um, uh, in motor. Um, you know, home obviously has got some pretty good margins in it as well. And, you know, in, in terms of the direct relationship, I th you know, we're up in quite a few millions now. So that's, it's growing quite encouragingly. That completes the Q&A. So, Mark, back to you. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything more this morning. Um, <laughs> you might be pleased on that, but um, because I think the numbers speak for themselves. I think it's a much simpler set of results. Tom and the team have done a lot to just push stuff above the line. Uh, probably even when we didn't have to, we just because we wanted to make the point about how clean they are. Um, but in this market, 4% growth, reaffirming the outlook, 10% growth in dividend. Uh, we've got a pretty good forward yield right now. Um, the rest is up to you guys, not up to us. On that note, I'll close it. <laughs>